to record or will you do that on your end? Oh, okay, it is on. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for again for the Lucy Lab uh, for this invitation. Uh, the title is somewhat ambitious. Uh, I obviously won't have time to talk about everything from Aristotle to neural networks in one hour. Uh, so what I thought I would do is, uh, this is actually the title of a book chapter that I wrote a few years ago. And uh, I was mainly doing this as an exercise to try and gather together uh, ideas on logic and learning uh, through the years and through the decades and centuries. And it turns out that you know there is a lot of um, overlap between the two areas of logic and learning. Uh, logic has been, you know, at least in the AI circles, logic has been somewhat uh, the old dog, um, a part of the good old fashioned AI, and machine learning is all the rage now. But um, the more people look into machine learning, I think more people are starting to realize that uh, without logic, uh, you lose a lot of structure about the real world. So I try to uh, gather together some notes about this um, uh, unification of these uh, two fields. And uh, I hope you get the idea that it's actually surprisingly deep. Um, and uh, it, it makes sense that we train students at the intersection of uh, logic and machine learning. So this is what I'll do. I'll give you a bit of history. And as you can guess, it's mainly about the balance between deduction and induction, uh, so uh, reasoning and learning. Um, and talk about a couple of different bridges. Now, these are not meant to be exhaustive. It's just uh, suggestive ways to think about different ways logic and learning come together. And I'll talk about one particular uh, result we have recently, which is, uh, to me at least, a very bizarre application of logic in machine learning. Um, uh, so it's called regularization. And I'll talk a bit about uh, talk a bit about that and how that's inspired some other work we're doing recently. As I said, these are just teasers for uh, the key ideas. Uh, there are two, these two book chapters that go into a bit more detail on how exactly all of this switched together. Uh, and uh, Constanza, just let me know if my voice drops or anything of that sort. As I said, I'm just a bit worried that might yeah, happen. Yeah, sure. Any, yeah. All right. Sure, so, uh, uh, so this uh, deduction versus induction is an old game. Um, I'm sure uh, um, many of you might have heard um, Aristotle's uh, uh, proclamation that you know there is this idea that human knowledge is basically um, you know the extraction of the uh, general from the particular, um, and then he wants to do reasoning with this general statement. So there's reasoning on the one side, but how do you go from the particular to the general? Of course, is an aspect of learning. Uh, so the different people uh, from different Different communities have looked at this issue. And I, I would say that to a large extent, the technologies as well as the methodologies and the frameworks they've developed are fairly distinct. Uh, there's obviously overlap, but they're quite distinct. Uh, but let's say generally we can think of this this way. On the logic side, what you typically do is you have some kind of knowledge-based delta, right? And you use some kind of semantical framework, uh, a truth theory or a proof theory to derive some formula phi. Now, what's often the most interesting case is when this phi is not explicitly present in delta. So you apply some uh, kind of proof system uh, to, be, uh, to infer phi uh, from what's available in delta, right? So this is when logic becomes interesting. And uh, in logic, we care a lot about um, uh, expressiveness and quantifiers. So we want to express things about the world in a general way. So we might say, for instance, uh, for every person who is, uh, say, a smoker, uh, he surely has a friend who is also a smoker. Uh, so these are the kinds of things we care about in logic. Uh, if you contrast that with machine learning, uh, or at least learning even more generally, often what we say is that we've observed a couple of instances. So this is d1 to dn. And then from these instances, we derive or uh, we induce essentially some d hat, which is some kind of generalized abstract average statement uh, of these instances. Okay, So again, different communities think about this differently. Uh, you know, the classic example from uh, from uh, the logic community and uh, going, uh, I guess, going back to uh, the philosoph philosophical discussions from Hume is, uh, you know, if you have uh, seen uh, only white swans, 
then you conclude that all swans are white. Um, and again, uh, once you encounter a black swan, it makes you revise your beliefs, right? A more closer to the machine learning literature, we often have this uh, very concrete way of doing things where we understand this world in terms of these independent and identically distributed random variables. So we say there are n variables you know, taken from some distribution. Often we don't know this distribution and often what we do is we parameterize a way to think about this distribution using theta. We search to different configurations and say, you know, from the data we have induced some distribution from these guys, okay? So even looking at these two points, you kind of see that there is a reason uh, we might care about bringing them to, uh, together. And people have done that, right? Uh, so uh, even within uh, the philosoph philosophical community, yeah, there's a lot of work, uh, for instance, as recently as, um, uh, I shouldn't say recently, maybe um, even, you know, going back, even going back to Rudolf Carnap, he worried a lot about how uh, logic and probability, uh, uh, you know, com come together to induce some hypothesis that might pertain to hu human learning, right? Uh, cognitive scientists often worry about how exactly do we uh, take um, observations from different sources and have some kind of prior structure about the world, which is getting refined uh, using Bayesian conditioning, say. Uh, more concretely in the AI community, we talk about learning and typically what we mean is, uh, uh, you know, something of the sort that I discussed in the previous slide. So you have some set of random variables taken from some distribution and you wanna train a model that classifies or learns these distributions, okay? so. Even though we all talk about, you know, the terms might be similar across these different communities, if they're not the same thing, but it's still worth interest, uh, you know, thinking about the connections between them uh, from a historical standpoint. Okay, um, and again, from a uh, my uh, from uh, from my point of view, is it's mainly in the AI literature that I would be interested in. And here we see some very interesting ways of doing things. So perhaps. Uh, going back to uh, the 1980s, when people started to take ideas from a logic and probability from the philosoph philosophical literature and started to apply it to AI, then they started making various modifications. They started thinking a bit more about representations. So this led to work uh, in what is called a star AI, uh, which stands for statistical relation AI. So as the name indicates, there's statistics, there's relational, so there's relational logic, and you bring them together, and that leads to star AI. Uh, plenty of different ideas there, both in terms of representation uh, as well as learning. Then there is the more recent uh, stuff, which is essentially neurosymbolic AI, uh, where uh, it takes the star AI idea a bit further and says, Let's concretely imagine the learning paradigm here in question uh, is a neural network. And let's see what happens when you combine neural networks and symbolic reasoning. There's also robotics, right? So this is kind of interesting because roboticists uh, perhaps have been dealing with uncertainty and logic for a long time, at least till the 1970s. But uh, uh, without meaning to offend, I think we can largely agree from a theoretical and conceptual stand, stand, standpoint, uh, robotics has not been super interesting. Uh, it somehow seems like the ideal application for uh, logic and probability, but we haven't seen uh, interesting theoretical ideas uh, on the unification from the robotics literature. But nonetheless, it's worth noting that uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, robotic, uh, roboticists very much uh, care about uh, combining reasoning and learning. Now, uh, one thing to note from a contrasting point of view is that even though machine learning has reached, has had a lot of successes, uh, people are starting to realize the limitations, okay? So, so for instance, one very obvious limitation is where is abstraction going to come from? Uh, now, uh, people sometimes look into neural networks and they look at the intermediate layers and they try to abstract away some detail, uh, but it's not been very satisfying, at least the way humans understanding uh, understand abstraction, which is to say that, you know, I can think of uh, think about something at, at different levels of granularity and reason at each of these levels, that kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, convincing account does not exist or does not emerge 
naturally in deep learning or machine learning models. Um, there is also causality. So if you think about, you know, which set of events might have affected some other set of events, there is a bit of human engineering in machine learning uh, and causality to really get causality to work. Um, and uh, somewhat in a similar context, if you think about constraints, you think about a model of the, phys of, of, of the physical world, you want to obey various laws like the laws of gravity and so on. And it isn't very obvious how exactly you put constraints into machine learning systems, right? So of course you assume that the training data uh, is somehow informs the machine learning model about the constraints about the real world, but ideally you'd like to be certain that the constraints hold and there isn't a very a clear cut way of uh, imposing constraints in machine learning models. One interesting but very, very informal kind of pitch here is also this idea that uh, going back to Daniel Kahneman, uh, you know, we want AI systems to basically have two type of uh, two types of um, capabilities. On the one side, uh, they need to reason and deliberate. On the other side, they need to experience things so that there is some kind of experiential approach uh, to uh, to functioning in the real world. And we want these two systems or two uh, two frameworks to balance. And uh, this is, I suppose, one of the holy grails uh, in uh, um, general, uh, general purpose AI. Now, uh, if you think about these, uh, these uh, different, uh, you know, developments, there is obviously uh, some key dimensions here, right? So going back to discussions in, in cognitive science, you know, what is prior knowledge? Where does it come from? How much of it do we provide as human experts or modelers? And how much of it should be, I don't know, induced from data, right? Then there's a question of acquiring. So this is a question of learning. Uh, how do we understand what the structure of the observation should be? So of course, in, in the case, you're simply trying to train a neural network to detect cats and dogs and images, there, there isn't anything deep. Uh, but if you think about understanding the granularity of that description, you know, a cat is an animal, a cat has whiskers, a cat has two eyes, etc. There is some kind of balance to be struck between a structural view of the world and what is observed from the data. And all of these uh, dimensions kind of, you know, are, um, are complex questions um, asking us to provide a very general way uh, to both reason and learn about the world. Okay, so um, these are the key dimensions uh, that come up when you think about uh, logic and learning. So I suppose one way to think about this, and you might have seen such a figure before, uh, is to uh, basically imagine AI as these two overlapping circles. Uh, on the one side you have logic and the other side you have learning. And uh, then we're gonna argue that everything interesting happens at the intersection, right? And now uh, here, keep in mind that, you know, this intersection is a very small one. Even if it's grow, it's a growing area, it's very small because in logic, um, as you might be aware, you can start thinking about modalities. You can start thinking about uh, quantifiers over infinite sets and all sorts of things. Uh, whereas the stuff that gets done at the intersection of learning and logic is uh, often very limited. Often they make the assumption that the domain is finite. Often they make the assumption that you restrict existential quantifiers, all sorts of things. Okay, So uh, there is a bit of a limitation there. I've hand drawn a slightly more complicated picture. Um, uh, let's see if I can get this across here. Uh, so uh, one other way of thinking about this is that, you know, the logic side will typically deal with a binary truth value, right? At least in classical logic. But of course we know that with fuzzy logic, truth values can also come from the real numbers. Now in logic, we can do deduction and induction, but often what's also interesting is abduction. And abduction is a way to really think about some of the stuff we do in machine learning. Um, so uh, that's on the logic side. So if you look at the machine learning side, often what people do is, as I said, they imagine independent and identically distributed random variables, x1 to xn, are taken from some distribution, okay? Um, and they think about classification or regression as a way of dividing the data points and labeling it. Now, uh, we want to look at the intersection. Typically in the intersection, we see things like inductive logic programming and statistical relation learning or star AI. But if you look even further at the deep learning aspect of it, uh, where you have uh, distributions defined over 
was some kind of parameter space, which could be the number of layers of your architecture or whatever, uh, then you have neurosymbolic AI. So a, finally more, a, fine, uh, uh, a slightly more granular description of this intersection between logic and learning, but again, lots of stuff is missing, at least from the logic side. Uh, we still have to still uh, grasp how we can uh, use some of the more expressive uh, modal languages and logic and apply them to machine learning in various ways. So what I'll do uh, for the rest of the talk is uh, basically break up uh, this area. Um, is everybody hearing me fine? Uh, all okay? Good. Yes, perfect. Uh, what I'll do uh, for the rest of the talk is uh, break this up into uh, three key themes. Okay, so uh, it just helps you think about the developments in uh, at the intersection of logic and learning in different ways. So on the first side, I'll try and compare the two. Okay, so what does it mean to compare? It means that we'll identify some tasks where you could either use machine learning techniques or logical reasoning techniques and kind of arrive at the same answer. Obviously, this doesn't mean that it can capture all of the tasks, but it can show that different ways of searching through combinatorial spaces can have different kinds of results and properties. Okay, so the, the, so the first one, it was, is it about comparison? The second thing is uh, looking at this um, Aristot uh, Aristotelian dream of learning the general from the particular. So how do we apply machine learning for logic, obviously in service of learning stuff. Uh, and the third one, I suppose, is more interesting from a model machine learning point of view. How do we take ideas uh, from logic and apply it to machine learning uh, to make it richer? Okay, so this, I think, is uh, the more interesting and somewhat nebulous space, right? So I think logical learning um, often tends to be more structured and more principled when you look at the third dimension. Um, you reach into a very nebulous space where you don't quite think of systems in a logical way. And uh, that's what I uh, meant at the start of the talk uh, uh, in the sense that when I discuss regularization, it's a very bizarre application of logic uh, for machine learning. Now, one thing I'll also say, and I won't go into too much detail, I'll just give you some hints, is that there is a very interesting work to be done uh, on this whole discrete versus continuous uh, dimension. So what do I mean by that? Uh, classically, if you go back to the 1990s, one of the arguments against logic uh, is often that, uh, you know, a logic is meant for discrete things, whereas everything we care about in machine learning is continuous. Um, and so on and so forth. And the thing is that, of course, this is a misunderstanding uh, of logic uh, because even though formulas in logic are discrete things, they can talk about continuous properties. And uh, so this is a gap that, uh, that uh, I have been very interested in uh, and uh, been working on for uh, a couple of years. Uh, so um, uh, finding ways to uh, bring ideas from what we understand in the continuous and the countably infinite uh, setting in logic and bringing that over to machine learning uh, is a super interesting angle. I'd say a bit about that, but not too much. So uh, let's start with the first dimension, okay? So uh, as the title indicates, what we really want to think about is if you talk about combinatorial problems, uh, problems that are often NP hard or even worse, uh, what can we say about the kinds of techniques we have uh, from logic uh, versus learning, okay? Now to, uh, to contrast, uh, you know, this, or at least put this discussion in context, it's worth thinking about what do machine learning people do with combinatorial problems, right? And uh, the main thing, and in fact, uh, to a large extent, the only thing they do is sample, okay? So they have some kind of combinatorial space they define a, a distribution over the space and they say, I'm going to generate a lot of samples that are uh, highly, that have high fidelity with this, uh, with this space. And um, as I uh, compact these answers, I have an understanding of what the space looks like, okay? So the only strategy the machine learning community has is sampling. And now the trouble with sampling 
is that you have no guarantees. So you only have uh, what are called as asymptotic guarantees, which is to say that if I generate infinitely many samples, then I have a real picture of the world, okay? But, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this doesn't happen. So you often have lots of cases where you don't have good samples and essentially the approach uh, becomes problematic. So let's look at what the, the logic uh, side has to offer, okay? The first thing to note is that, um, as I mentioned, uh, one reason you might want to consider uh, logic-based combinatorial solvers is if the representation itself has a logical angle, okay? So uh, what you see here is a programming language called Problog. Uh, this is basically Prolog, uh, which is a classic logic programming uh, language with probabilities, okay? So you put probabilities on atoms. So in this case, I'm defining two, coin or two types of coins. Uh, one is a fair coin, so 50-50 uh, of falling heads or tails. The other one is a slightly biased coin where a 60% chance of it falling heads. And I'm now going to define a composite event, okay? So I'm gonna say uh, um, the chance of me seeing two heads is if both of these false heads, which of course makes sense. And then I can use this programming language to derive queries. So for instance, uh, if I query the probability of heads one, it's just going to return the value already in the program, which is 0.5. If I query the probability of heads two, again, it's going to return what's already in the program of 0.6. Uh, but then you, you define the query of the composite. It's uh, because of the nature of how uh, you can obtain two heads, right? The different ways, it becomes a product of the two, okay? And because they are independent, it's just a product and you don't have to subtract anything further, okay? Um, does that make sense on uh, how that works? Uh, so uh, that's so in this case, uh, uh, this is a programming language which has uh, some aspect of logical stuff. And then you might wonder if it's already based in logic, why do I have to use um, a machine learning approaches uh, to derive answers? And that's a fair point. Okay, so that's one of the reasons you might prefer logic-based combinatorial solvers. Uh, here is a slightly more um, uh, concrete example. Um, so uh, on the left-hand side is a Bayesian network uh, as defined by UDAPL. Uh, this uh, Bayesian networks became very popular in the 1980s and 90s uh, as a way to uh, define uh, multivariable distributions in a more compact way, okay? So basically it's called factorization. Rather than defining a joint distribution, which might be exponential in size, you simply identify uh, the causal relationships between uh, probabilistic variables and it, show, it, it can be shown that the distribution, uh, the joint distribution for such a representation is much more compact than the full joint distribution, okay? So in this case, for instance, you're saying the alarm can be triggered. So there's some kind of probability for the alarm being true if both burglary and the earthquake happens. And likewise, there's some probability for John calling the ambulance uh, if the alarm is true. Okay, so you condition uh, these choices and define distributions. Um, and this is a much more compact way than the exponential representation. Now the same Bayesian network can also be written as a problem program, which is on the right-hand side. Uh, in the orange box. And uh, you can kind of see that uh, in some sense, the logical implication is playing the role of the causal um, implication, okay? So there's some uh, trick to this as to why this works. I won't be able to go into it uh, right now, uh, but it's, it is still a logic programming implication, but yet, nonetheless, it works like a causal one, okay? So there's a certain reason why it works. Uh, but I won't go into it. One interesting thing to note here, uh, he, uh, sorry, the second interesting thing to note here, the first interesting being the logical implication working is causal. The second interesting thing to note here is that in case you have multiple people, John, Mary, and so on, you can define this using uh, variables, right? So you don't have to ground it out. So you can have some first order features when you define more complex models, okay? Um, now, what happens is that, it, you know, you could write this down as a Bayesian network, you could write this down as a problem program, but what's most interesting for us is that regardless of which one you do, there is a way to write this down in propositional logic, 
Okay, it actually uh, is, is, is uh, I mean, at least uh, initially, it's very counterintuitive um, um, to some extent um, uh, because uh, what you're doing is, um, uh, is that you're defining uh, a bi-direction implication between the parents and the children. Maybe that's not that counterintuitive, but the more bizarre thing is you can write the probabilities as weights of all of the atoms, okay? Now, uh, this obviously, uh, if you look at this weight specification, you might be tempted to think, does this mean all of the variables are independent? And of course they're not, right? Because there is condition dependence between the parents and the children. So you might wonder, how, how is this working, right? How does it do the right job? Uh, and that's what I said uh, by saying that it's somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, so there is a way in which uh, the specification and the encoding uh, computes the answer. But what are you trying to compute? And that's uh, called as weighted model counting. So classically, when you have some formula in proposition logic, you do this thing of finding one model for the formula. What you need to do in these cases is that you need to consider all the models, okay? So it's no longer NP hard, right? So finding one model is NP hard. You have to find all version, all models. So this is what is called a sharp P, which is a counting version of NP. And for each of these models, you compute the weight, uh, which is defined uh, uh, in this way, okay? So you um, multiply all the weights of the individual uh, literals that are true in the model. So it's a bit strange when you see it, uh, because I think um, uh, the way the definition is set up, it forces you to think that all these atoms are independent, but of course they're not. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, somewhat bizarrely, uh, they compute uh, the probability of the Bayesian network, okay? So if you're looking at a conditional probability in the Bayesian network, there's a way to write this down in logic, uh, do uh, model counting and get the right answer. So all of this uh, uh, seems a kind of uh, a funny way of doing things if you have a Bayesian network, but it turns out, in fact, that a whole range of other uh, or representations from factor graphs, which are um, uh, undirected models. There's also an undirected relational model called as Markov logic networks. All of these different things uh, can be written down as weighted model counting. So surprisingly, um, this way of doing things gives you somewhat of a general purpose way of doing reasoning with probabilistic uh, logic, okay? Uh, again, this is all propositional. Uh, so, uh, but at least in the proposition setting, you have a, a, a sort of a domain independent way of doing, uh, of doing inference. Now, because you're doing SAT, you can do exact SAT and you can also do exact model counting. So suddenly now, uh, what was previously only, uh, you could only do with sampling, now you can do exactly under certain assumptions, okay? And even in the weighted model counting space, people have been looking at different ways of doing approximation that doesn't simply resort to sampling, that provides more guarantees. So um, weighted model counting is one of the state-of-the-art techniques uh, for doing uh, reasoning. And that, again, to me, at least, is very surprising. Uh, uh, it's not just that it's competitive. It's, it's actually that it's more, uh, much more robust and much more general. So a few years ago, uh, given the success of this weight model counting, uh, we started to wonder, well, what would it look like to look at a continuous distribution, okay? So if you think about like a very simple continuous distribution, such as a Gaussian or any kind of bell curve, now one thing to note is that uh, you, of course, def you of course you define this density, right? So it's no longer a prob probability mass. You're defining a density for uh, for this curve, for the points on this curve. But moreover, uh, there is some stability, right? So you can you can break down this curve into small pieces. So here you can see in a dotted line a very coarse breakup, okay? And in the x-axis, you have regions for each of these shapes, right? So you have uh, kind of a piecewise uh, model, okay? Now, uh, what we realized is that uh, we can write down these pieces, okay? So you can say, for instance, uh, for all values uh, less than one, minus 1. 1.5, either you can give a constant value, okay? So in this case, this is a constant, but you can also define a polynomial, 
right? Or you can also define something else. So you can define a, a functional space uh, for these regions. And it turns out just by doing this, we now have a way of repeating the success of weighted model counting, but a continuous setting. So what do we do? We basically sum up these pieces, okay? And for each of these pieces, uh, rather than simply multiplying numbers, which might be the case in piecewise constant, we, we would potentially integrate if the uh, density is much, a more complex object, okay? So if it's a kind of polynomial, then we would integrate and it helps you uh, compute um, exact inference in a discrete continuous models using uh, logic-based combinatorial solvers. In particular, we need to use what are called as SMT solvers. SMT stands for uh, satisfiability modular theories. So these are the extension of SAT, but for uh, linear arithmetic and so on. And you can use these SMT solvers to repeat the success of weighted model counting. Uh, you can continue this uh, project um, and uh, then think about, well, is there ways to work with countably infinite domains? Okay, so countably infinite domains, uh, a classic example is natural numbers, right? So in this case, let's say you have a knowledge base that looks like this, that says that you have these three variables that go over the rate, uh, that are defined over the set of natural numbers. Um, and you have some sort of a formula, um, a quantifier free formula inside uh, that's open. Uh, if you wanted to compute uh, SAT or model count, uh, we can basically show that, um, and this is something people have known in logic, right? Uh, for certain restricted queries, you can do decidability uh, by restricting the number of constants by looking at sub formula, sub models and so on. So essentially we can look at also probabilistic models that have this a uh, bizarre thing that even though in principle they're infinite in nature, at least for a given query, we can look at sub models and compute the answer, okay? So in this sense, uh, logic-based approaches are providing surprisingly uh, new and interesting ways of doing probabilistic inference. So again, if you uh, to take stock of where we are in the machine learning literature, the only thing we have is sampling, whereas in the logic literature, we have a whole range of other things that we could try out. And as I said, uh, they are quite competitive. To bring this back to machine learning, uh, why is the inference so interesting is that in fact, anything you do in learning, right? You're often computing probabilities. You know, see, so you, you check the probability of some, uh, of the fit of your structure against your examples. And based on that, you refine the structure, okay? So essentially in this sense, you can use uh, inference as a core component of learning. So solving the reasoning or the inference problem is a big step towards learning, okay? Uh, so uh, this is uh, in, in a way where um, com uh, comparing logic and learning for combinatorial problems uh, is an interesting uh, mathematical project of his own. Everybody is good for so, so far? Uh, still, yeah. I'll turn now to this uh, second theme, okay? This is again, uh, the, as I said, the Aristotle, Aristotelian dream of acquiring new knowledge so getting um, uh, general statements from particulars, essentially from looking at uh, examples, uh, you, uh, you get a hypothesis. So this is also uh, the kind of things that Rudolf Carnap uh, was very interested in. Um, so um, I won't go into uh, too much detail here, but just tell you the general structure of what's happening. So classically, what we do in this case of applying machine learning for logic uh, is that we are either interested in learning knowledge, right? So uh, an example would be an ontology about the world. So for instance, of course, we know that cats are animals, but as you go to more complex objects, you might want to learn relationships between objects, which, which is hard for a human to write down. And this is why you might want to learn knowledge on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, you might have knowledge and you may want to check that this knowledge is consistent by observing data, okay? 
So these are the two often cases that you need to learn knowledge uh, or uh, learn logical formulas. And here, uh, the hypothesis that you're learning could be anything, okay? It could be formulas, it could be programs. There is this uh, set of things that are recently coming up in machine learning called tractable representations. So these are basically a certain a logical formulas in a certain normal form which have attractive computational properties, okay? So it could be any of these things that you're trying to learn. And you may know this, uh, but there are uh, these two main uh, approaches for doing this, okay? So the, the, the first approach is to basically say, let me guess a hypothesis such that when I take it together with the background knowledge, I entail all the examples, okay? The second approach, uh, which may be less familiar to those not uh, in the machine learning community is to basically say that I'm gonna find a hypothesis such that on the one hand, okay, some uh, property I define uh, with, respect, uh, with respect to the hypothesis and the data is better than every other hypothesis that I have. Okay, so it's the best representation of the data. And again, this delta that, that you see here uh, could take into account the size of the hypothesis, right? Because the trivial hypothesis is simply to list all the examples, right? And this is a perfect representation of the data. You don't want this. You want to have a compact representation of the data, but you want to find the best of these compact representations, okay? So in finding a hypothesis such that uh, the distance between the hypothesis and the data, however you define it, is the best, right? The smallest, so to speak. Um, and uh, you define this, uh, as I said, define this property as a function uh, of the size of the hypothesis. So you don't want a trivial representation of the data, okay? So these are the two uh, classic ways of doing uh, hypothesis learning. And there's, it is still a very active and exciting area of research. I thought I would just add one more thing to this picture. Uh, one interesting observation from the computational complexity uh, people is that when we started looking at the correctness of this hypothesis that you learn, uh, there is something bizarre happening here in the sense that you're guessing, if you look at uh, the first approach, for instance, uh, it's guessing a hypothesis that best characterizes the data that you've seen, right? So you might be wondering, what about the data you haven't seen? And again, if you think about the white swan example, you'll see what I mean. If, you, if you've only seen white swans, uh, then your hypothesis might say that all swans are white. And let's say the next data point you see is a black swan, okay? And you need to revise this hypothesis. So in some sense, all the learning you've done uh, goes away. So uh, so people in co complexity theory have been trying to understand if there is some unknown distribution that's generating these examples, what can we say about how robustly we are learning the hypothesis? As it turns out, uh, things don't look good, okay? So we can, we can show that uh, even if you're learning a hypothesis from things like 3CNF, uh, you have, um, you have uh, severe uh, restrictions and you don't often, are not able to learn tractably, okay? So you're not able to learn in polynomial time, a good hypothesis for the data, okay? So a few years ago, uh, we started looking at this idea of implicit learning, okay? So what's the idea? Uh, so classically, if you look at the left-hand side, you have examples x1 to xm, and you do some kind of learning procedure like the ones I talked about, and you learn these hypotheses or rules, right? You have phi1, phi2, to phi k, which might be the different rules you learn. So one of these phi's might be that all swans are white, et cetera, okay? Uh, and then you get a query, and then you say, well, the query's entailed a lot, right? With respect to some background knowledge. What we do in, in this very specific case where the only thing you care about is answering the query, is that rather than learning these rules, we take the examples and we use them as a kind of uh, verification procedure against this query, okay? So basically what we're doing is uh, given a query, we'll check against uh, K examples, whether this query is entailed given the background knowledge, and if it's not, we reject it, okay? It turns out uh, this kind of trick of avoiding a building a representation of the data uh, leads to uh, uh, learning learnability results that are very promising. Um, so uh, you might have to look into the paper for more details, 
Uh, but the key idea is that you avoid, you know, trying to construct an explicit hypothesis, and that helps you a lot. And you have some uh, polynomial time guarantees uh, for things like first order logic with contably infinite domains, for linear arithmetic, and a whole range of other things. We've also looked at a version of this for multi agent beliefs. Okay. Uh, now, there is obviously downsides here because you don't have an explicit representation of the hypothesis. You, you can't carry it around, right? So every time you get a query, you have to rerun uh, uh, this check. Okay. Uh, so there's a downside. There's no hypothesis I can show you and I can say this is what is being learned, right? So there's no uh, explainability on that front, uh, but it does provide some interesting theoretical properties and that's something you're still interested in. I mean, one of the things that's kind of interesting about implicit learning is that in a way, if you think about a neural network learning, uh, it, it is learning implicitly, right? It doesn't give you an explicit representation of the hypothesis. So the question is, uh, is there a, if there's a way to understand uh, the correctness of neural network learning, again, using implicit uh, learning ideas, okay? Uh, I, I guess I should uh, try and wrap up in the next five minutes or so, 10 minutes, roughly. Yes, 10 minutes is fine. 10 minutes is fine, okay, good. Okay. This brings me to the uh, to the third uh, camp, okay, uh, which I said uh, is where things get very uh, nebulous in terms of semantics and correctness and so on. Uh, but it's this idea that what if we could uh, empower uh, and enhance what people are doing in machine learning using logic, okay? So uh, there are some non-trivial questions here uh, that I don't think we have the theoretical foundations to really even formulate, let alone explore, okay? So I've loosely called this a structured meta representations uh, for distributions in learning regimes. So it sounds somewhat complicated. Let's see what it does. Okay, so um, uh, what ways can log logic uh, help you with machine learning, okay? Uh, one thing, as I said, uh, is that in logic, we have done lots of work on trying to understand uh, decidability, uh, representational power, uh, reasoning power, and so on and so forth. So the question is, can you take these ideas and come up with probability, uh, probabilistic representations that closely match uh, these limitations, these restrictions? And if you do, uh, can you say interesting things in them? Okay, a classic example is we know that reasoning in uh, the two variable fragment of logic uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, fast. Uh, so can we define probabilistic models that use this fragment? And can we say interesting things with it, right? So that's the kind of stuff we can do here. I've scratched it out to say that, uh, not that it's not valid, just to say that I'm not gonna be discussing that uh, in these slides, okay? I'll briefly mention uh, uh, the idea of using logic for abstraction and programming. And you've seen an example of uh, programming at least in terms of problem. And finally, uh, uh, it come, I, I'll come to the bizarre application of using logic uh, for regularization, okay? So let's look at this uh, programming model idea. So the key idea is uh, that if you think back about the problem program, I said that you know to compute this using a logic-based solver, what you basically do is that you consider all the models of, of the proposition theory, you assign some weights to it, right? And you sum it up and that gives you a way to do probability. Now, uh, the question is, what if I wasn't dealing with probabilities? What if I was dealing with hard and soft constraints and I was trying to find the most number of constraints that I could satisfy? Okay, or what if I was computing gradients? So gradients are essentially the key uh, computational entity in deep learning, right? Where you're trying to see how close uh, the, the model that you've learned matches the true distribution. And you're trying to come up with a better and be better uh, model until you converge and stop, okay? And that's when the a deep learning system would converge and stop and say, this is the model that I've learned, okay? It turns out that uh, all of these different kinds of sub-problems from soft constraints to gradients, again, could be seen uh, in the weighted model counting landscape. But the only thing you would be doing is rather than summing it up, you have some kind of semi-ring structure that you're using. So instead of sum, 
you might consider max, you might consider min, you might consider average and a whole bunch of other things. And this helps you realize that in fact, this weighted model counting idea is a surprisingly powerful approach that could help you piece together different things we care about in AI in, in a kind of unified landscape, okay? So this makes it much more powerful than you know, simply predicting something because you have a computational way of piecing together different types of things from probabilistic reasoning uh, to search to max to min uh, to optimization all in under one umbrella. Okay, so uh, there's been some work on trying to come up with unified programming languages uh, for not just uh, probabilistic reasoning or inference, but a more broader landscape, including optimization and search. The abstraction idea is uh, something that I mentioned before. As I said, you know, humans think about things at different levels of abstraction, right? Uh, so we understand events at a lower level and a high level and maybe multiple high levels. So here's a simple example. This is a very complex probabilistic model on the left-hand side. And let's say all I really need to care is whether this variable here, the one on the rightmost side is a yes or a no, okay? Uh, perhaps there's a way to collapse this whole probabilistic model into one variable. And the question is, if I do this, what am I losing, okay? So we looked at uh, some, uh, some results on this uh, where we can uh, leverage ideas on bisimulation uh, from logic uh, to basically establish a way to think about in which sense is the collapsed model agreeing with the high level model. And if it is, can, is it sufficient to only use that in uh, our tasks, right? So if this, this can be uh, approached from the perspective of uh, computational expressiveness, this can be approached from the perspective of making things simpler and explainable. All of these different aspects uh, could be seen as instances of abstraction. And uh, uh, as I said, we use ideas from logical bisimulation to study these kinds of things. So I'll turn to the uh, very last um, application of logic for learning, okay? Uh, this is where I, uh, uh, this is the question of constraints. And I mentioned constraints a few times. Uh, very concretely, what I have in mind here is that I have this uh, squ a rectangular uh, or square region, and I only want to sample uh, from these, in these blue regions, okay? So I don't want to sample anywhere outside this blue region. So why might this be interesting? So for instance, you could consider the case where uh, you're trying to uh, pick something up and uh, the blue region might represent the valid spaces and everything else might be dangerous, okay? You might hit somebody, you might break something. So you only want to sample from these blue regions. Now, geometrically, of course, uh, it, you can look at this figure and describe it uh, fairly easily. So you can say, for instance, if I'm looking at the X and Y axis, I'm looking at uh, the value of, uh, the, uh, you know, the X should always be greater than minus 0.5 and less than 0.5 and so on and so forth. So you can define all of these rectangles geometrically. Now, the question is, how do you get a machine learning system to respect these constraints, okay? And uh, if you remember what I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, there isn't a very obvious way to tack on constraints into machine learning systems. So this is an area of research that's kind of uh, uh, becoming very interesting re uh, recently because of safety critical domains and so on. So how does this look like uh, from a mathematical uh, viewpoint? Okay, so let's assume I have this neural network, right? So the neural network is giving me a distribution. Uh, there is some kind of parameterization of this neural network, which might involve the number of internal layers and so on. And this is this uh, object theta, okay? So the theta is parameterizing this network, okay? Uh, and if you look at the equation on top, what it's basically saying is that I have n samples, okay? All of these samples are presumably taken uh, from the same distribution, and they're all uh, independent and identically distributed. Moreover, each of those samples respects my constraint phi. Uh, phi is this geometric description, okay? So this is what I want the model to do. How do I do it? Uh, and it turns out it's not easy to do, okay? So uh, in fact, uh, I don't show this here, uh, but uh, there are results uh, that we've done 
in some of our works where if you train the network uh, without telling this constraint explicitly, it, uh, it, it often doesn't converge or it takes extremely long to converge on the right samples. And moreover, it generates a lot of, a lot of invalid samples, okay? So this, you know, purely training the model, assuming that more data is better, doesn't work. Okay, so especially if you have complicated constraints, it's very unlikely that the, that the network learns these constraints. So you need a way to engineer these constraints into the uh, into the training regime. Okay, and we have taken uh, one uh, possible of way of doing this. So there's uh, lots of other related work uh, on how exactly you do this. But what we do is that uh, so uh, if if you think about what we're doing with the neural network. We have uh, we are given you know a capital X, which are all the samples, right? Um, and we want to generate, uh, we want to learn this distribution such that um, it aligns uh, with the uh, label that we have provided. Okay. What we do here is that when we train this network, we take the logical formula phi, and there's a way in which we mask this formula into the training. So every time the model is getting trained. It, there is a way in which signal is sent back to the model about whether it's respecting the constraint or not, okay? Um, um, this is what, you know, the architecture looks like. Uh, we don't need to really uh, look into this in any detail, but what matters here is that the, on the input side, we are, um, uh, we know that these inputs are satisfy the constraint. And what we want is the output to basically satisfy the constraint too. And we can take a logical formula, write this down in a certain way and train the network using this, uh, uh, this loss function. And we can show that the results uh, are as you'd expect. So basically we can get 100% constraint satisfaction um, as a result of uh, doing this, okay? So just to uh, compare it, if you think about a model that doesn't know about this constraint at all, this is the blue line. Um, and if you train one where it understands this constraint but doesn't really uh, um, uh, uh, completely embed it, uh, it shows that you almost never get 100% satisfaction, okay? So you can have uh, lots of invalid data points if you don't find a rigorous way of embedding the constraint into the training. To see one uh, cute example of what this, what such a constraint could look like, uh, there is this problem of weak supervision where uh, if you're training a neural network, you don't give it signals uh, directly about the label, but rather you give it a delayed signal, okay? So in this case, for instance, um, I'm defining the addition operation, right? So two plus zero, of course, is zero two. 1 plus uh, 2 is 0, 3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what I want to do is I want to give only this to the network, okay? I only want to give uh, this as the input and that, uh, this as the input and that as the output. And I want the network to figure out what the intermediate digits are. And so what does my constraint look like? Uh, basically, I'm saying I have four possible um, uh, or four po possible variables, right? All of the, uh, or they can have all sorts of combinations of, of values. So for instance, if the first two are zero, then the second two are zero. If the first is zero and the second is one, then the third will be zero and the fourth will be one, right? Zero plus one is zero, one. Uh, if, and if you look at the last example, nine plus nine gives you one and eight, right? Gives you 18. So this is my constraint. I train the network. Um, it gives, not only does it satisfy this constraint, but I'm also able to retrieve, okay, what is implicitly learned by the network. Okay, so I've never given it uh, lab, uh, these images and labels directly. All I've given it are these constraints and this as my training data, and the network is able to work out what is a zero, what is a one, and what is a two. Right, uh, so you can think of this as uh, in a more complex setting where you might have more complex operations uh, between the inputs and the outputs and the network is able to work this out. Of course, this is not a foolproof way. I mean, the network still struggles uh, even in this case. So you can imagine with more complex formulas, uh, we need to do some deeper uh, ways of understanding and getting the network to do the right thing. So this has led, led us to a bunch of follow-up questions, okay? So one thing we wanna understand is, we, in this case, uh, the network obviously did the right thing. Uh, it figured out what is a zero and what is a one. 
but what is what exactly is uh, the hypothesis that it's supposed to learn? So is there a way we can think about verifying the network against some kind of logical property? Okay, so we have some work in progress right now where we're thinking about a logical characterization of this weak signal. Uh, and the approach we take is using inductive logic programming as a, a meta level characterization of what the network should learn. Okay, uh, so basically we are giving you a formula where ideally the network should have learned that formula. Whether it does learn it or doesn't is a question that a verifier will be able to tell us. So this helps us, I think, implicitly check that the network is learning the right thing. The other kind of thing we're also doing is uh, looking at this uh, interesting uh, and very bizarre uh, thing that's happening where this logical formula is somehow enforcing the network to learn the right distribution. So we need to find a relationship between the geometric space that the network is learning and the logical formula itself. So we have been doing some work on trying to find a bridge between the formula and the geometric properties of the network that ends up being trained. As I said, these are, are, are very nebulous, right? So unlike uh, something like inductive logic programming, which is very principled and very easy to understand from a logical point of view, uh, these uh, topics are raising interesting things that I don't think we have the tools for. Okay, so as logicians, it's an interesting kind of project to figure out what exactly the tools we need to understand and characterize uh, these kinds of systems. Okay, uh, uh, I also wanted to briefly mention uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work on uh, looking at uh, the uh, intersection of large uh, of uh, large language models and logic, uh, and by this I mean either using large language models to encode. Uh, sentences into logical formulas using logical solvers as a kind of oracle uh, to ensure that the large language model produces a correct and coherent answer. Okay, uh, I can I can talk a bit more about that uh, if there's time, but um, that's what uh, we are mostly interested in based on this work. So to wrap, uh, um, I discussed that there are three different ways of thinking about where logic and learning come together. Obviously, uh, some are a bit more developed than the others. Uh, ultimately, this is all about balancing knowledge. Uh, and, I mean, and by this, I mean human knowledge and human uh, approved knowledge uh, with data and observations, okay? Uh, for logicians, I think there's super interesting things to be said about learning knowledge. Uh, from data for logics. But again, uh, since most of this work is propositional or finite domain relational logic, there's a lot more we can do uh, for richer logics, okay? Uh, but I think the more nebulous and uh, uh, challenging and somewhat unclear uh, direction here is how exactly can we add knowledge and structure to machine learning and what does it mean? How do we understand this as logicians? How do we characterize correctness, soundness and completeness? And there's a whole range of things I don't think we have the tools for, um, which is interesting. Um, more broadly, uh, of course, uh, you know, this is not simply uh, an intellectual exercise, right? Uh, 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 th there are results that show that using logical formulas for training neural networks leads to more efficiency. There's a whole uh, bunch of literature buying neural networks, again, using logical tools. And uh, if you think about interpretability, uh, both from the specification of uh, giving knowledge to the network and extracting it, its knowledge, this becomes a really important point from a human-centric uh, human uh, usability point of view. Uh, with that, uh, I'll wrap up. I think I went slightly over time. Apologies for that. <laughs>